aim in this video is to introduce a distinction between two types of constitutive principles that I want to call essential principles and ascriptive principles. Essential principles are those which reveal the nature or the raison d'etre of social institutions. Ascriptive principles are those which determine the conditions for the obtaining and functioning of institutional entities. What I want to argue is that the constitution of social institutions should come with a distinction between two levels corresponding to the two types of constitutive principles, ascriptive and essential ones. At one level, the underlying level, we have essential principles which pertain to the point of social institutions, to that in view of which we have the institution in the first place, in abstraction from their instantiation in a particular institutionalized form. Essential principles pertain to how institutional practices are situated in, so in human societies. At a more superficial level, we have ascriptive principles which pertain to the very institutionalization of those entities, which give shape to them and which determine how institutional statuses obtain. Ascriptive principles pertain to the instantiation of institutional practices. In what follows in this video, I will start by exposing the distinction between the two types of constitutive principles through an analogy between competitive games and other social institutions. And I will construct the analogy based on a distinction in levels of constitution of social institutions. And then in the remaining of my time, I will just briefly suggest the direction I want to take for making sense of essential principles. Let me take some examples of ascriptive and essential principles to make it more tangible. My claim is that games, as well as many other social institutions, involve both ascriptive principles and essential principles. Let's take a pair of examples from competitive games. The chess bishop moves in a diagonal way. This I want to categorize as an ascriptive principle because a bishop as a chess piece is defined through this principle to be the piece which moves in a diagonal way. This way of moving partly defines in what consists being a chess bishop. Now take the principle according to which in competitive games, the aim of the players is winning. This I categorize as an essential principle because it pertains to one goal of the social practice of competitive games, that in view of which we engage in the practice of competitive games. Winning within the context of playing competitive games is a value which gives significance to the social practice of competitive games. Now let's take another pair of examples about uh, money as an institutional entity. That a certain kind of green inked paper issued by the Bureau of Engraving and Printing is a dollar is an ascriptive principle in my terminology because it's part of the conditions through which we impose the status of a dollar bill on a certain piece of green inked paper. But that money is a means of exchange is an essential principle because it pertains to the raison d'etre of money in human society that in view of which we have money in human society. Now, let me take a third and final example, this time from the social act of promising. That promising generates obligation is also an essential principle because it pertains to the point of the practice of promising, to that in view of which the practice of promising is enforced in human societies. My claim is that ascriptive and essential principles pertain to two different levels in the relation to constitution of social institutions and that we can extend this leveling or levelizing to many other social institutions. In what follows, I will focus on only on social practices, but the framework can be extended to many other social institutions rather than practices. So let me 
build my story of levels. Take castling. Castling is a moving chess. But castling is not a self-standing practice. It is a sub-practice, or more precisely, it is a non-practice component of the game of chess. It's a move defined inside the practice of chess. It takes its meaning from within the context of playing chess so that it's dependent for its, meaning, for its being meaningful on the practice of chess. Now, take chess itself. Chess itself is a, is a self-standing practice. Chess is not a component of competitive games. It is one species of competitive games, one way of engaging in competitive games. And I would guessly take French marriage. French marriage is also a self-standing practice. French marriage is not a component of marriage. It is one species of marriage, one form of marriage, one way of marriage. Now take best man or honeymoon. Best man or honeymoon as analogous to castling or checkmate is not a self-standing practice. It is, it is a composing part of some special forms of marriages, for example, uh, Anglospheric marriages or French marriages. It is a non-practice component of French or Anglospheric marriages. It takes its significance from within the context of those forms of marriages. Now, to apply the distinction between ascriptive and essential principles on these, uh, on these leveling, we can say that castling and basement do not involve any essential principles. They just involve ascriptive principles. But chess, as a social practice, involves both ascriptive principles and essential principles insofar as, it is, insofar as it is a way of performing the practice of competitive games. And the same leveling can be applied to many other social practices such as marriage, voting, buying, etc., etc. So very roughly, we can say that chess and French marriage are on one level, competitive games and marriage are on another level. Marriages cannot be performed to core just as competitive games cannot be performed to core. In order for them, for games and marriages, to be performable, they need to be instantiated through a procedure which would determine their realization in concrete manifestations, in concrete instantiations. Now, principles underlying competitive games and marriage, independent of the forms they take, for example, French marriage, Islamic marriage, etc., are what I call essential principles. When these social practices are institutionalized in one form or another, French marriage, Islamic marriage, newer marriage, etc., we pass through what I call ascriptive principles, which pertain to the determination of the form of the practice and its function. They determine ascriptive principles determine how the how the practice is to be realized or instantiated in a particular form against the background of its essential rule. So the constitution of these social practices should come with a distinction between two levels. At one level, the underlying level. We have essential principles which pertain to these social practices in their brute or naked state before, that is in abstraction from, they're getting instantiated in a particular form in abstraction from their getting institutionalized. And at a more superficial level, we have ascriptive principles which pertain to the institutionalization of those practices, which give shape to them and which determine how they obtain. The underlying idea is that sorry, social practices such as competitive games come to existence in human societies only in view of some functions, needs, or values. There is some point to them which situate them in the heart of human society. And this is why they are 
underlain by what are called essential principles. Essential principles pertain to those values or aims in view of which, in response to which, social practices are determined than in different institutional contexts, in different forms. On the other hand, moves and games like chessling and checkmate or certain, other, certain concepts defined within other institutional practices, such as um, basement and honeymoon, there are those concepts which pertain to composing parts of um, the comp composing parts of institutional practices that do not have any sense outside the framework of those institutional practices, do not them are not themselves underlain by essential rules, and they take their meaning. Those concepts like basement and checkmate or castle, they take their meaning only through the ascriptive principles which define them inside within the context of institution, the institutional practice in question. They only make sense from within the institutionalized forms. Now, to complete the picture, I also want to claim that ordinary speech acts like promising and assertion do not need institution, institutionalization in the sense that they, they do not need a particular formatting which would determine them in a particular institutional context. They can come to be performed to court so that it's difficult to talk about ascriptive principles when we talk, when you're talking about um, promising and assertion in the ordinary use of the term. Uh, for me to explain it more, we can say that while social practices such as competitive games marriage, voting, etc., cannot be performed outside a particular institutionalized realization, an act such as promising as we know it in ordinary speech remains a social practice with no need for institutionalization. Ordinary speech acts then denote social practices which are different from marriage, voting, games, insofar as there's no need for a particular formatting in order for them to be performed. Of course, promising needs some outward expression for its performability, but the, this concretization of the expression of promising through, for example, understandable science or a conventional language does not mean institutionalization of the practice of promising itself. Indeed, in order to promise, we should express the promise of intention, but the answer to the two questions how do we promise and what normative consequences follow from the act of promising can be given without reference to a particular way to which we perform the speech act of promising. Whereas in the case of marriage or competitive games, an answer to these two questions cannot be given independently of a particular context in which the how and the what then of the practice have been determined. So to recapitulate, ascriptive principles determine the conditions for the obtaining or functioning of institutional entities in, a, in an institutional context. They have a determining role in the concrete instantiation of institutional entities. But essential principles situate institutional entities in human society. They disclose the locus of social institutions. They are related to the significance of the institutional entities. Institutional practices always emerge so as to serve some function and purport to some values in human societies. They have some point in view of which they emerge and remain as, and remain as existing in society. Essential principles pertain to the raison d'etre of social institutions. They thus lay on the foundation of social institutions as types and are context independent. Now, with this characterization that I gave of ascriptive and essential principles, we can say that ascriptive principles are similar to the standard or, uh, let's say, orthodox idea of constitutive rules. Constitutive rules are standardly conceived of as defining or determining institutional statuses. Through them, a status is imposed on some entity. By laying down conditions for an institutional status to obtain, 
constitutive rules thereby create that series. Rules of checkmate are constitutive in this standard sense insofar as they define the status of checkmate. So take the example of a rule of checkmate, the king being attacked and there being no move to go out of check counts as checkmate. Through this principle or rule, the status of checkmate is imposed on or ascribed to a form of action. It brings into being the status of checkmate. But on the, on the other hand, what, what can we say about essential principles? It seems that the case of essential principles is more controversial. Take the principle that you aim at winning in competitive games. It might seem that this principle merely makes explicit what is already implicit in the underlying structure of competitive games, that it merely describes what competitive games aim at. I also precisely characterize essential principles as laying on the foundation of social institutions and as pertaining to this latter's significance so that they are presupposed to any definition which we will try to give of those institutions in particular contexts. How can we explain essential principles? I characterize them as constitutive principles, as a type of constitutive principles. Note that the word institution coming from the Latin in plus statuary means to set up, to establish, to cause, to stand. So that institutions are related to established laws and practices or customs. Now, to be sure, institutional practices are established in human societies as having the points and functions they have. For example, the social practice of promising is established in human societies as generating obligation, or the practice of competitive games is established in human societies as uh, having for the players the aim of winning. Now, I just, because I just had 20 minutes for this video, what I want to do in uh, the five uh, remaining minutes is just to suggest the direction I want to take to clarify the concept of essential principles. I said when I was introducing the distinction between essential and, and ascriptive principles, I said that we can extend uh, the framework into many other social institutions. What I want to say now is that essential principles cannot be applied to all institutional practices unqualifiedly. Essential principles, as I characterize them, pertain only to a subclass of institutional practices, to those which are what I want to call essentially social practices. Essential principles correspond, and this is my claim, that I, can, I will not have time to argue for fully, but I will just suggest it. Essential principles correspond to the underlying structure of essentially social practices, and insofar as institutional practices involve imposition of a status on some entities in view of a function, if they are essentially social in their basis, if those institutional practices are essentially social in their basis, those principles, which pertain to their functions and values, are themselves constitutive principles or constitutive rules. Now, how, how can I characterize essentially social practices? I want to define essentially social practices as those which involve human interaction, as those which involve interaction of at least two people in view of a goal. Now, how can I characterize the concept of interaction? I take it that interaction, for interaction to be possible, two conditions should be met. First, there need to be some joint attitude towards that in view of which we interact. And second, interaction involves some minimal form of commitment. In fact, if two individuals interact, each individual should have some attitude and should act upon the recognition that the other person has as well the same attitude towards the objective of interaction in a way which implies a minimal form of commitment between the two parties, even if only in the weak sense of commitment, the commitment resulting from mutual expectations involved in view of that to which the interaction aspires, in view of the objective of the interaction. So the notion of joint, when I say that essentially social, social practices or those practices 
which involve interaction, and interaction involves joint attitudes, the notion of joint as I use it here is a sharing in an active sense. It's a sharing which is mutually recognized, which is not the non-committal third personal point of view. It's not just, I, it's not that I have that attitude and you turn out to have that same attitude. We should share the attitude in an active way in the sense of mutually recognizing, recognizing it. In other words, I use the notion of joint attitude to mean second personal attitude in the sense that it is an attitude which each of the persons involved has and each knows that the other has it. It involves, say, recursive inferences. So essentially social practices are, are those practices in which we have this active notion of sharing. With this characterization that I just briefly suggested without uh, explaining, and I'm so sorry, uh, we can say that voting, marrying, and playing competitive games, the examples that I gave, are essentially social practices because all of them involve interaction of individuals. Whereas for example, practices such as driving and murder are not essentially social in character. In order for murder to be performed, the person who is to be murdered, his intentionality is not required in an active way. So murdering is not an essentially social activity. Now, just to finish this uh, short parenthesis in the second part. It is known that these institutional entities involve man restored relations and properties. Indeed, the distinctive feature of institutional entities is that they involve imposition of statuses on certain entities in view of some functions such that they involve the anti consequences. And the direction that I want to take in order to argue with the essential principles of constitutive is that essential principles are cubic tributary to the second personal structure of interactions. They just pertain to those practices which are essentially social in character so that they are tributary to the second personal structure of interactions. And therefore, once an institutional practice is established, if it is an essentially social learning spirit, then those underlying principles pertaining to the point of the institution are essential principles, which are nonetheless constitutive principles. I know that I didn't have time to fully argue why essential principles are themselves constitutive, constitutive principles, but I just wanted to point to, to the direction that I want to take.